LinkedIn presents. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Matthew Dix about how creative people and the maker of things can approach time more thoughtfully and productively. Matthew Dix, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Connecticut. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about how creative people and the maker of things can approach time more thoughtfully and productively. And I love the way you framed that up for me as we were preparing for the episode. You sent over some materials like that is a wonderful a way to think about creativity and to think about how we utilize time and resources um, to help individuals, teams, and organizations be better and do more cool stuff. Uh, so that's what we're going to be exploring together. And I'm really excited for the conversation. As we get started, I wanted to share Matthew's bio with everybody. Matthew Dix is the author of Someday is Today and nine other books, a best selling novelist nationally recognized storyteller, and award-winning elementary school teacher. He teaches storytelling and communications at universities, corporate workplaces, and community organizations. Together with his wife, he created the organization Speak Up to help others share their stories. They also co-host the Speak Up Storytelling podcast. He lives in Connecticut with his family. And you can find more about him at www.matthewdix.com. A uh, pleasure to have you, Matthew. Anything else you would like to share by way of your background, personal context, anything you'd like to highlight before we dive on into the conversation? No, we have talked about my past far too much already. <laughs> Let's move forward. <laughs> uh, so- sounds sounds great. All right. So why don't you start by telling us just a little bit more about the creatives. Uh, when you talk about creative people, the maker of things, what do you mean by that? I think a lot of people have in their mind kind of this preconceived notion of what it means to be creative, artistic, innovative. Um, what do you think about those terms and, and how does that relate to the common workplace? Well, I tend to think it's anybody really. And that's sort of an idea I'm hoping to get people to buy into. You know, I was consulting with a woman who is looking to be more productive in her life and her creative pursuit is gardening. She's always mm-hmm. wanted to have a garden in the backyard. And, you know, I think a lot of people would see a vegetable garden as not an artistic pursuit. And I see it as, you know, supremely artistic. Like you're going to dig in the soil and make things that you will eventually eat. I think that's kind of extraordinary. But I think so often we look at that versus a novelist or a sculptor or someone who's building a business and we see them as very different. And I I just think it's the pursuit of the passion that you have in a meaningful and purposeful way with an acknowledgement that there is a sort of a, a horizon that we're chasing, that we should set some goals, that we should know where we're going. And maybe that horizon isn't so defined. So we allow ourselves a little flexibility along the way. But, you know, I just don't think we should judge what we see as creative is any less than, you know, another person's creativity. Another client of mine actually heard what she wants to do right now is watch all the movies on the Criterion channel with her husband and then have conversations after each one. And she said, I feel kind of embarrassed to tell people that that's sort of my mission right now. And I said, that sounds like a beautiful mission. Let's Mm. figure out a way to make that happen in a meaningful and purposeful way and, and then charge forward and do it. So you might be building a business or you might be sculpting a 
a, a brilliant, you know, piece of architecture, or, you know, a statue, or you might be a novelist like me or a storyteller, whatever you're doing, I think you're making things if you're sort of putting something into the world that didn't exist previously. Yeah, and I completely agree with that framing. While I don't always think of myself or haven't traditionally always thought of myself as a super creative person. You know, I'm not super artistic. Um, I do write a lot. I like writing, but I'm not like a creative writer. I don't write stories. Um, and so in my mind, you know, especially, I, I don't really think that way today, but in the past, you know, I, I found myself falling into those common societal narratives around what creativity is. And it was really wonderful when I, I remember when the first time I really started to kind of break that that framing and and think about it in the ways you're describing it was probably i don't know 15 years ago or so and i'm like well wait a minute you know i'm i'm musical i sing uh, i play some instruments i really love music i that's definitely creative um i i i do a lot of writing it tends to be more practitioner based you know business related writing but i do a lot of writing that's pretty creative i do things you know i didn't do it at the time but i do things like this podcast that's creative uh, i do entrepreneurial stuff that's creative like you're doing a lot of things to stretch you know, to, to stretch the muscles, to build the muscles around creativity and innovation. And I think we sometimes sell ourselves short if we fall into these societal narratives around, well, I, you know, I'm not a painter, so I'm not creative. Um, no, we all can be creative. And in fact, there are ways we can develop our creativity skills and do more creative stuff and put ourselves in environments where we can be more creative and innovative. Uh, but we have to first recognize that we have that potential. Yeah, you're right. We sell ourselves short all the time. And a lot of times what we do is we don't recognize that what we're doing, other people can't do. So like if I leave the room I'm in right now and walk into my living room, it's beautiful. Like every item in my living room was chosen by my wife with great specificity. And I would never be able to make a room look as beautiful as she has. And yet if I asked her, is this an act of creativity? I think she would probably say no. She would just mm -hmm. say, I bought things that work well together. And so it, the idea of selling yourself short, you know, I can't do what she did to bring such joy and happiness to me every day I walk into that room. And yet she probably doesn't consider it the most creative act in, in her life. And I see it as supremely creative. Yeah, absolutely. So if if now if we connect this idea of being a maker of things, being creative in a more inclusive definition of that, uh, and then we connect that with doing things thoughtfully and produ increasing productivity. Uh, productivity is not something that a lot of people often associate with creativity either, by the way. <laughs> a lot of times <laughs> we think about efficiency and, and productivity and we're like, that's not creative. That's just like process or or whatever. But in fact, uh, it's, it's another realm where you can become more thoughtful and more productive as you lean into your creativity. Sometimes it's because of process, sometimes you come up with a really cool new way to approach something that saves you time and you can do it better, faster or whatever. But uh, talk to us a little bit more about how you think about creativity as it relates to, um, you know, how you approach time more thoughtfully and, productive and, and productively. I think one of the struggles that especially creative people have is that so often the act of creation, the act of making something is viewed as sort of precious and lovely and sort of, you know, this ornate thing that should be treated well. So I meet writers who tell me they can only write between the hours of 10 and two, and they really mm -hmm. like a coffee shop with some smooth jazz and, and a cappuccino. And, you know, I remind them that there were soldiers in the trenches of World War I wearing gas masks bombs exploding overhead and they literally had notebooks that they were scribbling in hoping that if they survived the battle this might be published someday you know the fact that you need a coffee shop to write is strange because people were writing long before coffee shops existed and yet somehow you know they managed to accomplish that goal but what happens i think with creative people like that woman actually with the garden mm -hmm. she sort of pictured it as i need a weekend to begin this project and i can't find a weekend and for her mm -hmm. i said well how about if you just buy some steaks today? How about if you just go on Amazon and buy steaks? Because that would be one step in a thousand that you need in order to achieve the garden, you know? And so rather than sort of being precious and pretentious quite often in the act of creation, we can instead look at this, we can instead look at our time as, well, some of the things I have to do require two minutes to get this job yeah. done. And some require eight minutes and some require 
a block of three hours. And if we stop being so precious about our time, we can make more things and we can become more productive. But we have to first acknowledge that we're just too precious with the act of creation. And we just see it as something that must be done in a certain way at a certain time under certain circumstances. And none of that is true. Yeah. And and I totally get where people are coming from. If they kind of have their, their method, right. To get into the creative flow and that's been successful for them in the past. And so they think I need to recreate that over and over again in order for me to function. I get that. I get why people have that approach, but there are a lot of ways you can get into a flow state and do creative stuff and don't sell yourself short again. Um, try different things out. Uh, and, and I think you'll find you know, that sometimes it is the coffee shop, but maybe you'll find that there are other times of day where you have a different kind of creativity that comes to you. Or if you're in a different context, it triggers something different and, and you're able to do some cool stuff. Um, so yeah, again, don't sell yourself short. And I like your approach with the gardener. Um, I, I find that sometimes, I mean, we all battle with procrastination. I, I think I'm a pretty efficient, a productive person. I don't feel like I, it's like one of my huge struggles, but I do notice like, yeah, there are times, especially when it's a bigger thing, you know, like uh, there, there are times where I'm just like, oh, I, I just feel really feel like I need a big block of time to be able to knock this out. Um, but if I can take a step back and realize, oh, there really are. I mean, there's the big part of it, but there are also like little steps. And and maybe today I'm just going to do steps one through three. It's going to take me half an hour. I can just, I can do that, uh, and I'm just going to do it. Uh, and what what I often find is not only you know if I literally only have time to do that one thing or those three little things, um, not only can I knock those out, so now I don't have to worry about them the next time. But a lot of times, once I just start going, then that unlocks my flow and it unlocks, you know, that, that procrastination that was kind of taking over that has now gone away. And then I realized, Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm ready to go. Like I I've been dreading this. I haven't wanted to do it, but I just started doing some simple things. I gained a little bit of momentum and now I'm ready to rock and roll. And that, you know, and then I'll, all of a sudden I pound out, you know, something really cool that I hadn't even planned on doing that day. Um, because I just got into that flow state and, yeah, you just, you never know uh, when those opportunities are going to arise and you don't want to sell yourself short and, um, you know, kind of set yourself up for failure because you're creating too many conditions under which you can be creative. Yeah, I I think that, you know, every act of creation, everything that we're going to make that's worth something is a thousand tiny steps. And some of the, and some of those steps are demanding in terms of everyone needs to be quiet and leave me alone for a little while, but so many of them don't. You know, um, you know, when the Sistine Chapel was painted, there was a day when Leonardo needed to buy paint and he needed to put up some scaffolding and buy a ladder and make sure that he would get up there and all of those steps, you know, and, you know, you said, maybe I can only do steps one, two, and three today. I always say, maybe you can do step two, 19 and 36 today. Mm -hmm. You know, I often tell people break your project into parts and then you don't have to do them in order. You just do the one that you can do on that day. You know, and so when you look at your time and you say, I literally for me, I will say, oh, I have eight minutes before I have to jump on a podcast with John. What can I accomplish in eight minutes? I'll tell you that before I spoke to you, I made a very quick recording for a team on, at a company who wanted me to respond to a question. And so I said, well, I could probably do that in eight minutes. And it took exactly eight minutes. I finished the recording. I looked and went, OK, and now I'm switching to this call. And so I think what happens with most people is they say, well, I only have eight minutes. What am I going to do? And then they do what most people do is they pick up their phone and they look at things that don't make them feel good and probably make them feel worse about themselves by the time they put their phone back down. So one of the things I always encourage people to do if they want to sort of start this journey is you make a list of everything you could do in 10 minutes and just make that list because our lives are mostly constructed of 10 minute increments that we waste. We waste by futzing around or looking at our phone or going into the pantry and grabbing a handful of potato chips. But if you actually have a list of things that you can do in 10 minutes and you have that list sort of in your brain and you ingrain it with yourself, when I have 10 minutes, I go, oh, well, my son's right over there. I can wrestle for 10 minutes and we will remember that for a very long time. Or I can pet the cat for 10 minutes or I can reread the page I wrote this morning. I don't think I can make new content right now. I can't advance my story. 
but I can go reread what I wrote and find the errors and look for revision opportunities. You know, I have a book by my door right now. It's the, um, it's the Groucho Marx uh, list of essays that he wrote over the course of his life, because I'm always waiting for my son to find his shoes before we go to like little league practice. And I know what happens to most people is while they're waiting for their kids or their spouse, they're looking at their phone by the door, but I have a book of Groucho Marx essays. So while I'm waiting by the door, I've positioned something so that I can be productive in a way that's joyous to me. I will laugh by the door reading a book while everyone else is sort of running around, you know, looking for the things they need to get out of the house. But we have to start thinking of our time in that way. In terms of minutes, you know, my production manager who read my book, she said the single most valuable thing I took from it was, she said, I always thought I needed at least 30 and sometimes 60 minutes to do something. And if I didn't have 30 or 60, I shouldn't even bother getting started. She said, now I look and I go, oh, four minutes. I could write three sentences in four minutes. And that's three sentences closer to what I'm trying to get to. So start thinking in minutes instead of larger chunks of time. I think that's going to help a lot. Yeah. And of course, it's appropriate to have downtime. And so you don't have to schedule every last moment of every day. And that's not what you're saying. But when but there are opportunities where you have smaller chunks of time, whether it's five minutes, the 10 minutes, the 20 minutes, whatever. And I really do notice like there, there are people who, unless they have a two hour chunk of time, they're just like, eh, I can't get anything done anyway. So I'm just not going to bother. <laughs> yeah. And, and then all of a sudden your day slips away from you and you really didn't get much done because you, you, uh, you fall into that trap and you waste your time. So absolutely practice self-care, have downtime, play with your kids, do, you know, go on a walk, do, do those sorts of things. And, and uh, some of those, you know, uh, you want to schedule too, or, or just at least make sure that you're prioritizing them. But there are other things like, you know, I have, you know, I have a meeting at uh, 11 o'clock and we're going to finish this podcast episode and I'm going to do a little bit of editing uh, and, and then maybe I'll have time to answer a few emails, or maybe I'll have a time to do X, Y, Z, whatever. And I, and if I, as long as I have that in my mind and I'm not just giving myself the out of saying, well, I, I, you know, I, I don't really have time to do anything. So I'm just going to kind of sit around for 15, 20 minutes, whatever, then I'm missing out. You, you add all those chunks of time out up throughout the day. And all of a sudden it's like, no wonder you're not getting stuff done. No wonder you're not being creative because you're locking yourself into this previous, you know, this preconceived notion that you have to have like huge chunks of time to get anything done. Yeah. You know, and I kind of, I can't stand the phrase downtime. Cause like, mm. if you listen, if you listen to what I said for those 10 minutes, like one of them was wrestle with my son and right. another one was pet my cat, which is a legitimate thing that I do <laughs> quite often. Right. I actually know the science behind that tells me that not only do I want to pet my cat, but it's actually great for my brain chemistry when you pet an animal. So like, I know both of those things are good for me, but I think what some people do is they say, I've got 12 minutes and they think of it as downtime, which is sort of, I'm going to waste the time. Mm. I am going to look at something that is meaningless that I will never remember and doesn't do me any good. Like one of my favorite things, and if you look at brain science, it's really, it's true. Just looking into a tree, laying underneath the tree and looking up into the branches and the leaves is incredibly good for your brain chemistry. And so if I have two minutes, if I'm outside at my car and I'm still waiting for my son for Little League or whatever, there's a tree right next to the driveway. And my son often finds me laying under the tree, looking up into the leaves. Now, someone might say Matt's taking downtime. But what I would say is I'm taking leisure time in a purposeful and productive way that I is know, I know is good for me and will be purposeful meaningful. and thoughtful, right? Yeah. And, but most people don't do that. I think most people's lives are led like water down a mountain. They just follow the path of least resistance. And then they reach a point in their life and they think, God, well, how did I end up here? And it's because they didn't take active decisions. And so often those decisions are more challenging than doing nothing. It's a little more challenging to lay under a tree to say, you're, say to yourself, I'm going to go lay under the tree. Or I'm going to go find the cat. Or I'm going to go wrestle with Charlie. It's much easier to say, I'm going to open up this phone and go look at something or watch a, a YouTube video that I will absolutely not remember three days from now. And just sort of like allow that drug to stimulate my brain in a negative way. That's what most people do. So if we just start thinking a little more proactively and, and productively in our downtime, we make our leisure time meaningful. I think that's really important.
yeah, I like being thoughtful and, and seeking meaning. And you're absolutely right. I love the, the idea of, of laying beneath a tree and looking up. That is fantastic. Or staring up at the clouds. Or I live around a bunch of mountains. And I one of my favorite things is just look out the window and just look at the mountains. Uh, any of those things. Or it, it literally doesn't even need to take two minutes. Like you can literally practice deep breathing and, you know, just some breath work, 30 seconds. And you can do like a mental reset. And like, those are very thoughtful, purposeful types of things, whether you use the the term downtime or whatever you want to call it, then ultimately you do those things consistently throughout the day. Um, you will be a much healthier person. Yeah, uh, and you'll you'll be, approach your work much better too. Cause when it actually comes time to do that real productive work, you're just going to be in a better headspace. My wife always says that yeah. I'm the only happy elementary school teacher she knows. <laughs> she says probably in the country. And I say, I just relentlessly cultivate positive brain chemistry and mm. a degree of optimism. And I think that helps me enormously. And I frankly don't think it takes very much other than saying to yourself, I believe that these small incremental changes over the course of time will add up to something in the same way that when I write a novel, I know I have to write about 100,000 words. So if I write three today, well, I don't have to write 100,000 anymore. I get to write a few less than that. And so incremental progress over time equates to extraordinary things. When you sent over materials in advance of this episode, and I was looking through it, you know, one of the the points you made was around your 100-year-old plan. Tell us a little bit more about that and how that relates to the conversation. Sure. It comes from the idea of regret, really. If you you know, there was a moment in my life when I was um, the victim of an armed robbery. A gun was put to my head and uh, the trigger was pulled. And it was a horrific and terrible night in my life. And the thing that astounded me most about that night was I truly believed that um, these three men were going to kill me. And they counted down from from three. And in those three seconds, which felt like forever, I didn't feel any fear or anger, or even sadness. The only thing I was consumed with was regret over the things I had yet to accomplish. And I was only 21 at the time. So, you know, it wasn't like I was 40 and had wasted my life, but I just felt deep regret. And if you speak to hospice workers, they will tell you that in the final days of people's lives, the things they tend to talk about most are regret. It's the things they haven't done. And so with that perspective in mind, I sort of adopted this philosophy I sort of understand, or I've come to this understanding that in the moment, we are very unreliable decision makers. Like if you ask me what I want to do right now, I would go play golf with a hot dog in one hand and a cheeseburger in the other. And that would be my ideal day. And if I did that every day, I would theoretically be happy, except I know I would not. At least what would happen is the hundred year old version of me, the one that I like to imagine on his deathbed at a hundred, he's looking back over his life. And that hundred year old version of me is saying, There are days when you should absolutely play golf and eat a hot dog. And maybe even many days, particularly if you're hanging out with friends and getting exercise and you put the bag on your back and you do all the things that are going to be good for you, do it for sure. But God, your kid's growing up so fast. Make sure you wrestle with him and cats don't live long enough. So you better pet them while they're still around, you know, and there's a lot of books to read. So make sure you put that Groucho Marx book by the door because you're going to want to get through that one. So when it comes time for me to make a decision about how I'm going to spend my time, truly, whether it's 10 minutes or 10 hours, I ask the hundred year old version of me, I say, what would you do? You know, and that causes me to make much better decisions. It causes me to go, he does not want me to watch television, you know? So I love television. I adore it. I think it's fantastic. And yet I watch very little of it because the hundred year old version of me says, go do something. There will be a time when nobody wants to hear from you anymore and you can't get up like you used to and you can't play golf anymore. And that's when you can go watch the 12 seasons of Dexter that your friend says you have to watch, right? But somehow I don't think at the end of my life, I'm going to be thinking, I didn't watch enough TV. You know, I think I'm going to be thinking other things and I'm trying to avoid thinking those other things. So I encourage people to play a much longer game and say, how should I spend today? Well, don't ask yourself in the moment, ask the future version of yourself because that person has more wisdom. And so often I have altered the course of my life in a meaningful and really healthy way by just saying, I just don't think the the future version of me wants to do this right now. Or the future version of me wants me to do it as afraid or as hard as this thing might seem that he's saying, do it now because you might never be able to do it again. 
So for yeah. goodness sake, like go do stand up, which was the scariest thing I have done mm. in a long time. Go do stand up comedy. You're probably going to bomb. and It's going to be terrible. But imagine if you got to the end of your life and you never tried. And so be thinking ahead and ask that future version of yourself. Seek that wisdom. I love it. Matthew, this has just been such a great conversation. You've given me a lot to think about. I really encourage the audience to do some self-reflection around all of this too, because I think we all have opportunities, room for improvement here uh, to not only just be more mentally and physically healthy and, and approach life in a, in a more uh, thoughtful and productive way. Uh, but to unleash, to unlock that creativity, the innovation that's within all of us. Again, that could be in our personal lives. That could be hobbies. That could be relationships, but it can be in the workplace too. And it can be with our teams and, and there's so much we can do. And I, I just love your perspective before we wrap things up for today. I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience, how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, where they can find your books, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. Uh, well, they can find me at matthewdix.com. Yeah, I also teach storytelling quite a bit. So if you go to storyworthymd dot com you can find lots of um, resources there and courses that i teach and things like that so if you want to tell better stories i think that's a wonderful way to sort of capture the time that we're talking about and sharing it with other people so those two places are pretty good places to start you can find my books wherever you get books so um that's not very hard uh, in terms very of good. a in terms of sort of a, a final thing, you know, I want people to always remember the number 1,440. I don't think it's a number that is known well enough in the world today. It is the number of minutes that you have in a single day. And as I said before, I think when we start thinking in minutes instead of blocks of time, I think our lives can start to change. And so if you keep that number in your head, that's a lot of minutes. That's that's a large number. And even if you spend half of them sleeping and, and probably maybe a little less than half is what I would recommend, um, <laughs> but maybe a third, you know, you still have a lot of minutes. And so yeah. when you think you don't have enough time to do things, remember 1,440 and just, that's a lot of time. Make sure that you're using it well. I love it. Matthew, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Matthew can do for you. Check out his books, check out his storytelling resources, all the really cool stuff uh, that Matthew is doing. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.